Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I on live? Can you hear? Okay, thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Neil Lane. I'm a senior fellow at the Baker Institute, and I want to uh, uh, welcome all of you here this evening for an uh, event we're very excited about as a, a part of our larger program. It's kind of a soggy evening, so we particularly appreciate your coming out uh, today. My role this evening is very simple, is to introduce our distinguished speakers and to give you an unsolicited commercial uh, before that. Uh, our program this evening is entitled Patenting Science, the Implication of the Embryonic Stem Cell Patent Battle, and I'll say in a minute what that is, but you'll hear from our speakers much more in detail. Uh, since about 2004, the Baker Institute, uh, in particular the uh, Science and Technology Policy Program has supported conferences, workshops, panels, speakers such as this evening uh, on stem cell research and, and policy. Our focus is obviously on the policy end. Uh, recently, the Baker Institute received a very generous endowment uh, for international stem cell policy from the state of Qatar uh, and the Emir of Qatar, His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani which has enabled us to establish what we're calling the International Stem Cell Policy Program. And we're very honored that the Vice President for Research of the Qatar Foundation, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdelali uh, Haudi, if I got it about right, is with us this evening. We're just delighted, Dr. Haudi, that you were able to come over. Uh, the mission of this new International Stem Cell Policy Program is to bring together scientists, ethicists, policymakers, media experts and community and business leaders to find new ways to engage the general public and their representatives in dialogue about stem cell research and policy. The program includes the U.S. conference series that we've called uh, Stem Cells Saving Lives or Crossing Lines. It's kind of double meaning. Uh, and that's included three conferences in Houston, two of them in Houston and one in Washington, D.C. It was in Washington, D.C. that we had the I had the uh, great privilege to chat with uh, our speaker this evening, Charles Reed, about this general issue. Um, there are several uh, research publications at the door if you would like to read more about this, and that ends my commercial. This evening's uh, stem cell discussion centers on the controversial stem cell patents obtained by the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and we call it WARF. And so let me give you a very brief history, but you'll hear much more. In 1998, a researcher, James Thompson, at the University of Wisconsin, published the first article on the isolation and culturing of human embryonic stem cells. <clears throat> that was a pivotal achievement, and since that achievement, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation has obtained three patents on both the techniques and the cells themselves. And because of the, of the existence of these patents, then anybody who wants to perform research involving these cells or the techniques that were patented must pay licensing fees. And if any marketable products are developed, royalties would also be required. Now, although the WARF has recently waived licensing fees for university-affiliated researchers, there's hesitation in the scientific community, particularly those connected with the private sector in one way or another, of course, as you know, the companies are a major supporter of stem cell research because our federal policy, President Bush's policy, is quite restrictive on what the federal government can do in this direction. So, so for the private sector to be hesitant here is, is an issue. Uh, the worry is that by initiating work on these cells or using these techniques uh, might expose uh, them or their institution to uh, legal problems down the road, so long as these patenting issues remain unclear. And indeed, the patents are currently being challenged. Uh, and as I understand the situation, the basis for the challenge, but we'll know from, from uh, Mr. Reed, is that James Thompson and his Wisconsin team uh, simply performed the next obvious step. Well, patents are supposed to be for things that are non-obvious, so an obvious next step not supposed to be patentable. In 2007, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office revoked the patents, and this ruling is still being challenged by Wisconsin. 
in the U.S. federal court system, and the impact of their ruling greatly affects embryonic stem cell research in the United States as well as across the world. The prerequisite that patents be non-obvious was first introduced some time ago in, uh, in, in the 1952 patent law, which was then later reviewed in 1966 in the U.S. case of Graham versus John Deere Company, which our speaker tonight knows a great deal about. Justice Tom Clark, writing for the majority, clarified a series of considerations to be reviewed when determining patents. Today we're going to discuss the court's decision and its implications on stem cell research and related issues perhaps, specifically the recent rejection of the patent for human embryonic stem cells and the method of their creation. Our keynote speaker this evening, uh, who will be followed by our second speaker, but our keynote speaker this evening is Mr. Charles Reed. He's a lawyer, he's a Rice, he's also an engineer, he's a Rice alum. He's with the Washington, D.C. firm of Kyle, Gorkian, Reed, and McManus, PLLC, where he practices corporate, international, and patent law. But the interesting story is, as a young attorney, he served as a law clerk for Justice Tom Clark, whom I mentioned earlier, at the United States Supreme Court. During the 1965 term, when arguably the most significant opinion in patent law was decided, namely the one I mentioned before, Graham versus John Deere Company. Justice Clark, who delivered the opinion for the court, subsequently took the unusual step of revealing that this young man, well, he was young, this young man actually drafted the opinion, which, uh, of course, made him famous. Our speaker holds a bachelor's degree from Rice University, which also made him famous. MS degree in chemical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. You may have heard of it. A certificate in fluid dynamics from the Institut Francais de Petrole, Paris, and a JD degree in law from the South Texas College of Law. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Rice alumnus, Mr. Charles Reed. Thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I want to mention at the outset not the text of my remarks. <laughs> Uh, that's the uh, the good news. Uh, the uh, the bad news is that uh, uh, I did not have the time to narrow down uh, my remarks, uh, and so I will uh, have to uh, try and uh, cover this material uh, in uh, as expeditious a manner as I can. Uh, one of the uh, nice things about being a lawyer is that uh, when you come uh, about a very thorny problem, as these cases represent, it's easy to have the right answer. Uh, for a lawyer to get a right answer, all he needs to do is get a client. Uh, your, your client is the right answer. Uh, tonight, however, my task is somewhat more difficult. I'm, uh, I'm required to be uh, non uh, 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 a non-advocate and try and address this material in as even-handed a manner as I can. Uh, today's discussion originates out of the three patents on embryonic stem cell research uh, inventions of Dr. James Thompson. These were assigned to WARF, as uh, 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 we've just heard. And uh, WARF is a uh, technology transfer adjunct to the University of Wisconsin. An attempt is underway to invalidate those patents in proceedings before the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which I'll refer to as PTO, which is lawyer's jargon, or the office, or any other uh, uh, names as, as I go along. Uh, specifically, the Foundation for Taxpayer Consumer Rights, a California organization represented by something called the uh, Public Patent Foundation of New York, seeks to cause the Patent Office to revoke the patent. The assertion is that the patents are overly broad and harmful to the public good. The second claim is that they do not meet the statutory requirements of patentability as interpreted by the courts and as inherently limited under the United States Constitution. These cases have created a firestorm of legal, scientific, 
and ethical comment. Some of the comment is serious, raising deep issues that require deep discussion and analysis. Some of the con comment is simply based on misunderstanding and raises false concerns. What I will talk about tonight are some of the major, more serious issues that, uh, that I see. I will cover tonight the legal and factual status of the wharf proceedings. This requires a brief primer on the patent law. I will discuss the specific procedural posture of the wharf cases and the substantive arguments that are uh, being made and bear on the question of whether the patents will survive. Now, I will tell you, uh, so as not to keep you in suspense, that I and my colleagues uh, in my law firm believe that the patents will survive, and I will explain why. I, I want to go on to discuss the uh, role of patents in today's scientific world, or more precisely in the exploding and I think exciting biotech field of which, the, uh, uh, which I presume most of you here today are a, a part. I will discuss the legal developments in the recent years that have impacted or will most likely impact patenting scientific effort. The Wharf patent battle also has a European front. Wharf has uh, patents applied for in the European Patent Office and also in various uh, members of the European community at their national offices. The, uh, there are important differences between the United States patent system and the patent system in Europe. And I, if I have time, I would like to discuss uh, a few of those differences or cover them as I go through this material uh, because I think it's very illuminating. Uh, I need to, uh, to make a disclaimer at the front. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be discussing some uh, cell biology patents. I'm not a geneticist, I'm not a biologist, and I confess that uh, today's uh, uh, talk required uh, a crash course in uh, cellular biology. I'm very thankful for the fact that my partner, uh, Scott Hudeman, has a PhD in this field, but I also want to say that uh, the errors I make are mine, not his. Uh, let's see. All right. I said that there are uh, three patents at issue. The, the issues in all of them, that is the scientific and legal issues, are pretty much the same. Uh, I'm going to discuss really the third one on that list, the 913 patent. Uh, it differs from the others in that this is a product patent only. The others are patent and method uh, patents, uh, which entail uh, some slight differences, but none, I think, that bear on uh, what we have to discuss today. Um, <clears throat> the battle in the title of this talk uh, stems from the, uh, uh, the request entered July 17, 2006, by the requesters for the reexamination. A reexamination is a procedure within the patent office by which a third party can challenge the grant of a patent. Uh, it's a very limited proceeding, and it can only be made on the basis that the prior art, uh, in the form of prior patents or publications, raise a substantial question about the patentability of a patent that has issued. Now, a third party can request this proceeding, uh, the owner of the patent itself can request this proceeding, and the patent office on its own initiative can, present, uh, can uh, initiate the proceeding. Uh, time won't permit a discussion of the strategy used here in initiating this through the patent office. Let me just say that in the case of this particular uh, reexamination requester, there was no other course. Uh, the only other way in which the validity of a patent is determined is through litigation. And this particular uh, requester is neither a licensee or a practitioner in the field where it is likely to be uh, challenged for using or infringing the patent. Uh, the requester took a risk. First of all, a reexamination proceeding 
is one uh, in which the party seeking to invalidate the patent has very limited resources. In litigation, uh, of course, you have the availability of all of the discovery rules, which can, uh, which can lead to extensive discovery. No evidence is being presented uh, in these proceedings by the patent requester other than to, uh, than to make a request, make the argument as to why the patent is uh, non-patentable uh, uh, and why, uh, uh, and to respond to the, uh, to the actions of the examiner. Now, uh, unfortunately, I uh, have to uh, uh, correct uh, uh, Dr. Lane. The, uh, this patent has not been rejected by the patent uh, office, uh, nor are there actually legal proceedings in the courts regarding it. Uh, we are still in the patent, uh, uh, the, the reexamination process. What has occurred is what is called the first office action. In the first office action, the examiner has announced that he finds the patent uh, unpatentable on the grounds of the basis cited by, by uh, Dr. Lane, namely that uh, the patent is uh, anticipated by the prior art and that it is an obvious patent, uh, an obvious invention, which, uh, which means that it is unpatentable. Now, the first office action is not a final action, and there's plenty of, uh, of uh, room still to go. Uh, the the owner, Wharf, has responded to the first office action, and the initiator has also responded to the first office action. The examiner has not made a response uh, to those responses. Ultimately, it is expected that he will make a final office action. That doesn't decide the matter. There are appeals within the patent office itself. There is a... Uh, a, uh, a administrative court, if you will, within the patent office, and it will make a determination if there is an adverse decision to either party. And finally, uh, there is an appeal from that to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. Federal Circuit Court of Appeals is a, uh, is a special court created by Congress in 1982 to handle all appeals on patent matters in order to get a uh, uniform national uh, jurisprudence on the issues of patents, which pose problems for most courts because of the, the complexity uh, and the uh, issues which are often involved in, in uh, patent litigation. And from there, there's yet another course, and that is a potential, uh, a potential appeal to the United States Supreme Court, which would be a discretionary right uh, by the uh, by the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, I'll I'll dis discuss the legal analysis of the issues involved on the question of obviousness and on uh, and on uh, novelty later on. But uh, let me just say that the examination process that is going on now is not one in which just on the basis of, of odds, this requester has a great chance. Here are the figures of what, uh, what experience has been to date on reexaminations, a procedure, by the way, that was adopted first in 1980 uh, and, uh, and amended in 1999. Uh, as you can see, uh, by the way, these are the uh, cumulative results through last year published by the Patent Office. In uh, third-party exams, uh, re-examination requests, 12% uh, of the patents are revoked, all of their claims. Uh, the balance of 88%, uh, you get a uh, certificate of re-examination. Sometimes, to the tune of 29%, there are, uh, 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 there are no amendments whatever, no changes whatever in the, uh, in the claims themselves. And in 59%, there are some changes made in the claims during the course of the reexamination. 
And that has already occurred here. This particular, uh, uh, this particular patent, uh, as it now is uh, framed in the reexamination, has some amendments from the, uh, from the patent as was issued. They are minor, uh, by the way. Uh, so we're a long way from having st uh, human stem cell uh, patents invalidated. Uh, and as I said before, I think, that, uh, uh, I, I think that the likelihood is that uh, this patent is going to survive. Um, to get to the discussion of the, the substantive issues involved, I have to digress for a moment, I'm afraid to say, to uh, offer a primer in, uh, in the patent law. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the right to a patent is embedded in the United States Constitution. It, uh, I don't know that you can read that, but uh, the patent clause uh, it, uh, provides that Congress uh, may, uh, uh, to promote the progress of science and useful arts, by securing for limited times to inventors the exclusive rights to their respective discoveries. The uh, political and economic justification for the grant of an exclusive patent, which is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, exclusive right, that is a patent, is the incentive it provides for invention, innovation and discovery of new and useful things, which in turn advance the health, welfare, and economic growth of society. Stated in that way, most people have no objection whatsoever to the notion of patents. Uh, Abraham Lincoln put it this way. He said, the patent system added the, fire, uh, the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. Uh, but there are other benefits to the patent system. One of them is, in order to get a patent, uh, you have to have or give a quid pro quo. You must disclose that uh, invention uh, and you must teach others how to use it so that the, uh, so that the uh, additional advantage of the patent system is the dissemination of knowledge. Uh, whatever the origins of the patent system and the economic theory which uh, underlies it, uh, it is clear that the patent system pervades all levels of science and technology in our day. Judge Newman, writing in a 1994 opinion, wrote as follows. I know of no major technological advance, no new industry or involving technology that has not participated in the patent system. It is estimated that 85 to 90 percent of the world's technology is disclosed only in patent documents. That's, uh, that's a very telling statement. And by the way, Judge Newman is not just a judge. Uh, Pauline Newman of the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, has a Ph.D. in science from uh, Yale. She was a research scientist for four years with uh, Cyanamid and a patent director at the FMC, one of the nation's largest uh, uh, companies involved in technology. Uh, it, uh, it also takes no convincing to this audience, I'm sure, to point out that uh, there has been a vast change in the, uh, in the use of patents. Let me just touch on a couple. Uh, this represents the, the uh, market value of the, st of the stocks of the uh, S&P 500 and repre represents a, uh, a composition of the assets of those corporations. A third of a century ago, intangible assets, which basically include intellectual property, uh, represented 17 percent of the assets of these corporations. Uh, at the end of, uh, of 2005, uh, they represented 80 percent. So you see the vast change in the use of, uh, of technology. Uh, this, uh, uh, I apologize for this slide, it's required by uh, my colleague Dr. Hudeman, uh, who uh, wanted me to point out to everybody that, uh, that this age uh, began, that is to say, this explosion in, uh, in 
the biotech industry with this particular patent, which is uh, uh, one of the first on recombinant genetics uh, by uh, Cohen and uh, Boyer. Uh, it, this is what launched Genentech. Now, it also takes no convincing to point out that the biotech industry, since that, since that seminal patent in 1982, I believe, uh, has, uh, uh, has created an industry of, Im of immense proportions. Uh, its, its market capitalization has gone from, I can't read the figures from here, to uh, $410 billion from 1994 to 2005. Its capital needs are enormous, $100 billion raised uh, during the last six, uh, the six year period from 2000 to 2005 alone. Uh, that industry consumes $20 billion a year to fund its uh, research and development. Uh, and its revenues in the healthcare, U.S. health care sector alone has increased its revenues from uh, nearly nine, is that nine, eight billion to 57 billion during that same period of time. So there is an enormous market uh, and enormous demands and funding has to come from somewhere. Uh, you all know that the funding from the federal government uh, has become a huge problem for fundamental research and even even uh, development research. Patents offer a mechanism for uh, for uh, providing some of that capital, some of the fuel to drive that inventive engine. That inventive engine. Uh, one of the ways of doing this, of course, has been the uh, technology transfer adjunct. Uh, uh, Dr. LeBron told me today that uh, Rice's uh, uh, adjunct uh, is, is merely six years old. Uh, Wharf, uh, who holds these patents, was the first. It was founded in 1924 for the purpose of taking research and development and, and exploiting it commercially to provide funding for further research and development. Um, <clears throat> Oh, by the way, I found this interesting. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is our balance of payments deficit uh, for the period from 1990 to 2006. One of the things technology has done is, is uh, held its own while the rest of uh, our economy uh, has, uh, has experienced a huge decline in our balance of payments. Well, the, uh, the need for patents uh, and their utility is, of course, is something I probably did not have to waste this time to, uh, to convince this audience. Let me return now to the, uh, to the legal issues. Uh, obviously, a, uh, not every invention, not every advance is, is entitled to, nor should it be entitled to, a protected monopoly. Uh, from the very beginning, in the uh, 1793 Patent Act, uh, the requirement uh, was that there be something more than just an ordinary advance. In fact, in the, uh, the language of the 1793 Act, was sufficiently useful and important. Uh, over the years, through uh, case development and uh, uh, various patent uh, acts of Congress, the, the basic requirement for a patent has, has come to be phrased as follows. In order to get a patent, it must be new, it must be useful, and it must be non-obvious. These are now incorporated in uh, statutory language uh, in the 1952 Patent Act. Uh, first, as to usefulness, uh, that's covered by Section 101 of uh, Title 35. Uh, to, uh, this is patentable subject matter. You can get a patent on a process, a machine, a manufacturer, a composition of matter, or uh, any improvement thereon. What is and is not patentable? There's a lot of confusion 
uh, on this subject, certainly uh, uh, by, uh, by laypersons. Uh, one of the problems associated with the patents we're discussing tonight is that most, uh, many people are concerned that a patent exists on something which is human. In fact, by the way, you cannot do that in Europe. Under the uh, European uh, patent law, uh, there are two provisions of that patent law which provide, one, you may not get a patent on anything uh, related to the human body, and the second is that you may not uh, get a patent which is contrary to public order. Uh, what that means, if we have time, I will discuss later, but it is certainly, uh, it is certainly engaged in the issue in, uh, in Europe over the wharf patents. Uh, I thought I might just point out a few things uh, that maybe some of you here don't know. Uh, you cannot patent naturally occurring organisms. That is to say, uh, you couldn't get a patent on a wild rose, but you can get a patent on, a, uh, on an organism uh, created or a plant created by asexual reproduction, uh, rose hybrids. In fact, that's been done since the uh, 1850s. You... Uh, you cannot patent laws of nature. Uh, Einstein could not have patented E equals MC squared. Uh, nor can you patent natural or physical phenomena, like gravity, uh, or abstract ideas. Uh, that, is in, that is entailed in the notion that a patent must be useful. That is to say, have immediate use uh, and... Uh, and be something apart from what naturally occurs. Uh, animals have been patented. Uh, in fact, Louis Pasteur got a patent on uh, a, a, a bacterium in 1873. In, uh, in uh, 1981, Chuck uh, Rabarti uh, received a patent on a, uh, a bacterium which degraded, uh, biodegraded oil. Um, and there, in the course of that opinion, uh, a very pithy uh, uh, little rule that you can carry around with you is uh, anything under the sun that is made by man is patentable. That surprises uh, some people, but in fact that is the law in the United States. The second uh, criterion is novelty. I'll just uh, bounce right through this uh, because I'm going to discuss it later in the substance of the discussion relating to the, uh, relating to the patent at issue here. And you can't patent something if someone else has already produced it, including yourself. Uh, in this country, if you, uh, if you write a scientific paper, uh, you've got one year to get to the patent office to patent uh, it, or it's no longer new. Uh, uh, the scope of the novelty claim uh, is, uh, is complicated. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, in order to be anticipated, which is what novelty is all about, uh, you must show that every claim, every element of a claim asserted to be unpatentable is covered in the prior art in a single reference. The, uh, the next requirement is non-obviousness. This one, frankly, is a toughie. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's the text of the uh, statute on the subject, and it incorporates this notion uh, it must be something that would not have been obvious to a person of ordinary skill in the art. The, uh, the history of, uh, of the obviousness uh, requirement is something that goes back a number of, of years. The first pat Supreme Court case on it was 1851, where a, a patent was sought on a doorknob, in which instead of making the knob of wood, it was made of glass. The court there said, no, no patent. Uh, there was... Uh, no more ingenuity or skill than was possessed by an ordinary mechanic acquainted with the business. As you can see, that's a paraphrase of, uh, of the law as it exists today. Well, from, from 1851 to 19, 
1952, the court system generated all kinds of, uh, of discussion as to what is and is not obvious. Obviousness is subjective. It also requires uh, hindsight. We have no means of time travel to go back to a state at the time the invention was made in order to determine what was the ordinary skill in the art. It poses a very difficult problem. It's the kind of problem that, uh, uh, that's commonly encountered in law. Uh, we deal with subjective issues all the time. What constitutes negligence? What constitutes obviousness? Well, by 1952, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of different ways of expressing this notion, and that was what originated these provisions in the 1952 Patent Act, which was drafted by three very patent-knowledgeable people. Uh, in uh, 1966, then, John, uh, Graham against John Deere came about. This case uh, was simply to, uh, to try uh, to set for uh, the national jurisprudence how you apply the 1952 Act. And in that case, what the court said is, here's what you do. First, you find out what is the scope and content of the prior art. Then what you do is you note what are the differences between that prior art and the invention which is being challenged. The next thing you do is determine whether the invention would have been obvious at the time the invention was made to a person having ordinary skill in the art, uh, abbreviated POSITA by every law student who ever takes a course in patents. <clears throat> There's another step, too, and that is objective indicia of non-obvious which is incorporated right into the uh, Graham opinion. There are factual issues uh, which bear on the subjective question of obviousness that could be applied. For example, uh, did this invention receive commercial success? If it did, the implication is, well, that was something, had it been obvious, would have been done by something else before because the incentive of the commercial success. Another is uh, long felt but unsolved needs. If there, is, if there are facts which can demonstrate that other people tried to reach a solution but failed, that is an objective indicia of whether or not something would have been obvious. It certainly wasn't obvious to those who failed. Uh, and uh, uh, long felt but unsolved needs. Have I got those two confused? I did, I'm sorry. They, they are considered separate, uh, uh, separate objective indicia, but you understand uh, the point that is being made. In, a, uh, in, in litigation, you would actually uh, present evidence on these issues, and from that, the trier of fact, and by the way, obviousness is a uh, question of fact, to be decided by the fact finder, a jury in the case of a jury, or a judge in the case of a bench trial. Uh, Things went along just swimmingly from uh, 1966 to last year. The uh, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals added somewhat to the uh, John Deere jurisprudence. It tried to formulate ways in which you could, uh, you could approach these questions more sy uh, systematically and uh, created what is called TSM, Teaching, Suggestions, and Motivation. In other words, uh, the prior art, it is said, uh, in, order, in order to render something obvious, should contain either a teaching or a suggestion or a motivation based on that prior art, uh, which would give someone knowledgeable in the field, posita, uh, a, uh, a road map for coming to this invention. If it's not there, then it was not obvious. Unfortunately, uh, as stated in, in the uh, Federal Circuit, that was uh, elevated almost to a uh, rigorous rule. The Supreme Court last year struck that down swiftly and said, no, that will not work. That is too rigid, uh, and, uh, and you simply uh, cannot rely on a rigid rule like that. 
you can still use the notion of finding uh, TSM, but you must use it flexibly, uh, and you can't use it rigidly as a, uh, as a bright line test. And you have to use common sense. I, I personally regret that the court used that phraseology. Common sense simply means that we don't know what it is. Uh, uh, these are some of the uh, some of the tidbits coming out of the uh, of the KSR test. The KR test uh, has many patent lawyers beating their chest. Uh, I think that the good news for this audience, those involved in scientific research and particularly uh, 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 cellular biology, is that this really doesn't have much application to, uh, to your fields because most of your patents and most of your inventions are not combination of old elements, which is what happens uh, is the fact pattern most in, uh, in cases that were dealt that are that are going to come up with obviousness issues to which KSR provides a, a roadmap. Incidentally, the invention in the KSR, K, uh, KS, KSR case was a uh, gas pedal that shifted back and forth so that uh, no matter how tall you are, you could uh, you could get to the back gas pedal. But what it did is it changed an electronic component for what had been a mechanical component. Uh, does that uh, ring a bell with Hotchkiss? The change of one known material for another? Uh, the, the facts of KSR are, are pretty self-evident, uh, uh, self and anyone reading, reading the invention, looking at the invention, would probably come to the same conclusion. Um, the uh, the last concept that is uh, of significance is the enablement requirement in Section 112 of uh, of Title 35. The uh, you recall I mentioned you had to have a uh, quid pro quo to get a patent. You have to teach everybody how to use the patent. Now this may fall uh, as a somewhat ironic thing for anyone who's ever read a patent, uh, where you're, uh, you're uh, supposed to be able to practice that patent from the wording in the patent. When I was a practicing engineer, I couldn't read a patent, much less uh, practice the patent based on the disclosure. But that is the law. So you must enable uh, someone skilled in the art to make and use your patent. Uh, that uh, element, by the way, is involved in this case. Um, I'm running very long on time, uh, Dr. Lane. I will try and uh, uh, wrap this up by a, uh, a rapid uh, run through the, uh, these cases. Uh, again, we're going to discuss the 913 case. Uh, here is the claim of the uh, claim number one of that patent. Uh, that is the language. A patent is defined by its claims. Your rights, your monopoly, are stated in the claims. A patent consists of a specification, which is description and teaching, but when it comes down to what you own, it is the claim. And by the way, uh, you mentioned, uh, I mentioned that it has been amended. The underscored portion uh, has been added. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the claim uh, under discussion, and any any issue of, uh, of patentability must focus on the on the claim, and these are the elements of the claim. This is uh, the rest of uh, of claim number one. What it does is it claims human embryonic stem cells, the cells themselves, the culture, as long as they meet these criteria or as long as these limitations apply to a culture of stem cells, then it's covered by this patent. In the, uh, oh, there was one more, I'm sorry. Uh, there are two other claims in the patent, but they're dependent claims. I won't go into them now. Uh, 
the, uh, the prior art that has been considered or, and is being considered by the examiner uh, are the following. Uh, a Williams patent issued in 1990, which, uh, which relate to uh, mouse embryonic stem cells and require uh, leukemia immune factor uh, to replace or supplement feeder cells. Uh, Hogan, a patent uh, issued in 1994, uh, which covers uh, embryonic germ cells from uh, human uh, germ cells uh, taken from testes from 10 and a half week old embryos uh, or, of, or postnatal human uh, cells. Robertson is a uh, publication uh, two of them, 1983 and 1987, which discusses uh, mouse uh, embryonic stem cells, and Pedrahita, which is a survey article on uh, isolating embryonic stem cells, but uh, specifically relating to uh, murine, porcine, and o ovine cells. Uh, reviewing that, uh, reviewing th that art. What the examiner said was, uh, first on the anticipation, uh, Williams directly anticipates it, and so does Hogan, meaning every element in the uh, claim was, was either expressly or inherently disclosed in those two references separately. On obviousness, uh, obviousness, does, uh, for practical purposes, differs from anticipation in the following way. In an obviousness claim, in an obvious argument, uh, you're entitled to combine prior art from more than one reference. If, uh, and if, by combining that art, each of the elements in the claim is in one or more, each and every element of the claim is in one or more of the uh, prior art references, obviousness has been, uh, will have been demonstrated. Uh, what the examiner did is he went through a long list of uh, combinations and pointed out uh, uh, or came to the view that collectively or individually they were uh, rendered the uh, patent or the invention obviousness, obvious and therefore not patentable. Uh, in the response, and, and I really don't want to uh, take more time to go through all of these details. Uh, the, uh, the responder went through a series of arguments and basically refuted each and every uh, statement made by the examiner uh, and with particularized references to where in the articles these things were said, the examiner took uh, uh, undue liberties. For example, uh, the, uh, the claim in the uh, Wharf patent is that you do not have LIF as a factor. These, these cells are cultured without LIF. They are required in, uh, in the uh, earlier ones. He also pointed out that, uh, that this is an area, uh, uh, well, I'll let you read for yourself. Hogan is the same way. Uh, these, they were, uh, dis well, let's see. Um, the argument was that Hogan discloses human uh, uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, the answer is simply flatly not true. Uh, germ cells are different from uh, uh, stem cells. Uh, the, the markers that are referred to there uh, are, not, uh, are not contained in the uh, cells uh, uh, disclosed by Hogan. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, those cells cannot uh, differentiate into the uh, trophoblast. I, I, I trust there are enough uh, biologists here to understand what that means. Uh, I can't claim that I fully understand it. Uh, Although I do know that the trophoblast is the uh, is the a, uh, an element of the uh, of the blastocyst, a, a membrane of the blastocyst. Uh, again, uh, let me just run through these arguments because uh, uh, 
stopping only on this one, uh, the obvious to try. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, had developed in the patent law was if something is obvious to try, uh, that would uh, indicate perhaps that it was in fact obvious. If, if, you, uh, if you merely uh, uh, wanted to create a uh, compound and there were a limited number of, of uh, reagents you could use to get the desired result, if it's obvious to try those, and you try them and they work, the argument would be it's, uh, it's obvious, no patent available. However, uh, the mere fact that something is obvious to try prior to KSR uh, was often held to be no bar to a finding of non-obviousness. The law today, after KSR, is you can still... Uh, apply an argument that something is obvious to try, and it will render a patent unpatentable on the grounds of obviousness if uh, th what is involved is no more than a routine set of uh, grunt work, if you will, of trying this, trying that, uh, a limited number of things. However, if the results that are reached are not predictable, if something, if, if the invention you discover results from using perhaps things that are obvious to try, but react in a different or unexpected way. And that is the claim made in the, uh, in the Wharf patents, that it is that murine, porcine, ovine uh, uh, embryology is much different than primate biology, uh, uh, reproductive biology, and it is not obvious that what works in, uh, in mice will work in primates. That is elucidated in the, uh, in the response. <clears throat> uh, another thing, of course, is the objective indicia. Uh, the responder, uh, the owner, Worf, has pointed out that there's been wide acclaim for this invention uh, and, in fact, points to instances of attempts by others to, uh, to synthesize these, uh, these cells who have failed. Uh, now, in any argument, there's always a counter-argument. The, uh, the argument is being made that, uh, that uh, the commercial success, or that rather that the claim is not the result of non-obvious scientific uh, ingenuity, uh, but, uh, but that uh, this Success is due mainly to the fact that Dr. Thompson was sitting in a big uh, uh, research institution, had the tools available to him. However, that is simply a misstatement of the law. How you reach an invention uh, is not an issue. And in fact, uh, without going back to the slide, uh, please accept my representation that Section 103 of the patent uh, of the 52 Act says expressly, the manner of invention shall not obviate uh, non-obviousness. Uh, that, by the way, was placed there specifically uh, beca uh, because it was thought in the, uh, in the patent bar that a uh, phrase in an uh, opinion by Justice Douglas where he said, to get a patent, uh, the, uh, uh, there must be a flash of genius, was in the enunciation of a new test. And that was placed there to indicate the manner of achieving an invention is simply not relevant. If you happen to fall on your face and your nose hits an idea, that's just as valid as a, as a researcher who has consumed $10 million and all the lab resources and has finally come up with the right answer. Uh, as for uh, a claim, uh, here, here's what uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Thompson has received in recognition of uh, his uh, work in development of uh, ES, human ESC cells. Makes a convincing argument to me. Uh, I had mentioned that uh, I had mentioned that the, in uh, Europe. The, the law is uh, somewhat different. There is a European patent convention which is establishes the EPO. The EPO, as I said, has, the, uh, uh, has these differences between the U.S. and the European system. However, however, 
uh, there's a way around it. You can, uh, a, a EPO issued patent, which covers the 20 member states of the EPO, uh, does, is still subject to attack under the laws of each of the 20, uh, 20 members. And in fact, those laws vary. And in, in point of fact, uh, Wharf has, uh, has claimed both as an EPO patent, but has gone to England and to Sweden into their national office for patents because the prohibitions are interpreted differently there. Uh, this entails very complicated issues of patent uh, strategy. Uh, unfortunately, I'm out of time, and I won't be able to uh, cover that. I want to cover just two more, uh, two more cases of significance to what I believe uh, have implications for science. One is the Metamune case, uh, which, uh, which deals with the declaratory judgments. In the past, uh, the Metamune case was last year also, a Supreme Court case. In the past, in order to, uh, uh, to bring a lawsuit uh, to challenge the validity of a patent, uh, the rule was that there had to be a case or controversy. There had to be a threat to the person seeking to in take the initiative to invalidate a patent. Uh, licensees, for example, could not challenge a patent. They had already accepted the patent and therefore was subject to something called licensee estoppel. The, the Supreme Court... Uh, uh, removed that barrier and under the facts of that case said it would be unreasonable not to allow this, uh, uh, this attacker of the patent from bringing this action because the, uh, 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 he was placed in jeopardy. He had a license. He was uh, put uh, to, the, uh, to the Hobson's choice of paying the royalties or or infringing the patent and perhaps have his license revoked, uh, leaving him in a, uh, a, an economic disaster. The court in that case said you don't have to, uh, uh, the standards for case and controversy were reduced. The other is the uh, eBay case. Uh, a patent is, a, is not a right to practice an invention. That's a common misconception. Uh, a patent is a right to prevent others from making, using, selling, offering to sell, or importing into the United States. The mere fact that you have a patent does not entitle you to practice your patent. For example, if you patent a new uh, uh, deadly uh, uh, toxin uh, for use in uh, warfare, you're not entitled to go make that toxin. Uh, there are other uh, prohibitions that, that may interpose. However, the, uh, the normal remedy available to someone in an infringement action, uh, a patent owner in an infringement action, get an injunction to stop someone. The court has held that you may, in order to get an injunction, you may have to demonstrate the equitable rules for an injunction. In other words, uh, an injunction is an extraordinary remedy. It's available only if uh, there is no other uh, way and you would suffer irreparable harm. And there are rules for what constitute irreparable harm. What these two cases represent, what the KSR case represents, are a tightening or constriction of, the, of patenting rights. Uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court goes through periods of restriction of patents and, uh, and we're in one of those restricted periods right now. Uh, uh, it is my hope that that will ease up. I happen to be a person who believes that patents uh, serve a very uh, useful function and, and ought to be lim liberalized uh, to a certain uh, degree. I would draw the line slightly different than others. Well, with that and my apologies for uh, going so long, uh, I'll take any questions and, and if there are any, and uh, otherwise, let me get out of here and let uh, Dr. Berenger, whom I happen to know because I checked it before I came here, has four patents in this identical area, and uh, no doubt will uh, will uh, uh, some of my remarks about what the patent office does in that first office action resonates with him. Thank you, Charles. We will take questions, but I think we do it at the end. Uh, after we heard uh, Dr. Berenger, I really appreciate
appreciate. I learned an enormous amount. Obviously, I have more to learn about patent law. Anybody thinks that patent law, or maybe law in general, is not a science, I think uh, we'd change their mind listening. It, it's a science, and it's extraordinarily challenging ones. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I would like to introduce now our second speaker, and I would also want to say that I started Charles Reed 20 minutes late, so he did not over speak his time, and thank you very much for your sensitivity on that. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Richard Berenger, who will be giving a few remarks on the, whatever he wants to say on the, from a science perspective, but however he would like to comment on patent law and specifically the WARF stem cell patents. Richard Berenger is the deputy chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics and the holder of the Ben F. Love, Ben Love being a name that we all cherish and very important to rise, the Ben F. Love Chair in Cancer Research at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, he is an internationally recognized developmental biologist who has made crucial contributions to our understanding of early embryonic decisions about the vertebrates, uh, vertebrates body parts. Dr. Berenger received his undergraduate degree from California State University and his PhD degree from the University of South Carolina. And please welcome Dr. Berenger. Well, thank you for the invitation to come and speak. Um, I was not aware of those four patents. <laughs> I'm very curious. Um, I'll, I'll start off with a disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an embryologist and a geneticist. And so I, I thought what I would do is just tell you a, a little bit about um, what we're doing with embryonic stem cells in the medical center, and 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 then finally kind of discuss a little bit if, if this patent is influencing our basic research. So uh, about uh, two years ago, yeah, about two years ago, um, NIH was um, giving extra money to researchers with NIH grants specifically to work with human embryonic stem cells. And all you had to do was write a little one-page thing and you would get some extra money, but specifically to work on human embryonic stem cells. So we did it, and we got some money. And um, part of getting the embryonic, human embryonic stem cells is you, you needed to go to uh, a training course, and that was at Wisconsin at Y-Cell. So I sent one of the people in my lab uh, to the course. And then in the fall of 06, we uh, received two of the different uh, NIH-approved human embryonic stem cell lines. We began, we began culturing them at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. We've been culturing them ever since. Um, so that kind of led us to start talking with other people in the Texas Medical Center using human embryonic stem cells. And so just across the street at Baylor, uh, there was a group of scientists who had already started culturing uh, the NIH-approved human embryonic stem cells, and we started to get talking. And um, the Institute of General Medicine at the NIH put out what's called an RFA. This is a request for grants on a specific topic, and the topic was to do basic research, fundamental research on, but you had to use human embryonic stem cells. Which is interesting because we're in Texas and, and, and the Bush restrictions on uni, human embryonic stem cells, yet here in Texas in the medical center, um, we, we were asked to, to put in a grant specifically to use human embryonic stem cells. And so we started collaborating or interacting with um, Peggy Goodell, who's the um, director of their stem cell center, and about 10 other uh, scientists. And we put in the grant for, it's called a program project grant because many um, investigators are involved. And uh, we were fortunate enough that we were one of two in the country to receive this grant. So that started last fall. And um, part of the uh, research in that grant uh, besides the basic research, is that we have a um, tissue culture facility. It's located at Baylor, and one of those uh, aims of that tissue culture facility is to train other scientists in the medical center. It doesn't just have to be Baylor. It doesn't have to be MD Anderson. It could be Rice University uh, individuals um, to teach them how to use and culture human embryonic stem cells. And our uh, role in this uh, grant is to genetically manipulate them. 
All of these studies were using the NIH-approved um, human embryonic stem cell lines. They're, the ones we're using are called H1 and H9. Um, so it's all approved. We can use the NIH funds. Um, and at the moment, um, the patent is not impeding any of our basic research um, ever since they rescinded the uh, licensing for uh, academic institutions. Um, so is this affecting us? No, not yet. Perhaps um, in the future, depending on how, uh, how, re how our research progresses, if we ever get to a point where a byproduct of our research might involve um, a product, um, a commercial product. I'd say one of the biggest hassles of um, the uh, interacting with y -Cell is um, something called a materials transfer agreement, an MTA. And this is where um, if a cell line is given or, or something else, it um, could be a mouse, it uh, could be a DNA plasmid, is sent from one institution to another, you have to fill out these agreements so that if I receive something, like a stem cell line, that I won't um, do something with it for commercial gain. And um, so we don't really want to do commercial gain for, this, for these stem cells for our current research, but um, we have to fill out these MTAs, and it actually is kind of a hassle because it has to go back and forth between institutions. And not only do we need these permissions for our individual institutions, but since we have this common grant between the two institutions, for us to get the same cells from Baylor to MD Anderson, we have to do another MTA. So uh, it's kind of a, an annoyance, but not prohibitive. Um, and then just a, a couple words, just from the perspective of an embryologist who's made mouse embryonic stem cells and, and who's now culturing human embryonic stem cells. Is it obvious? Um, perhaps not the way it was defined, but just if I stand back and think from the pioneering work for the generation of mouse embryonic stem cells, which was first reported in 1981, and then subsequently the generation of primate monkey embryonic stem cells by Jamie Thompson at Wisconsin, and then finally the human embryonic stem cells, and then having cultured them and how they uh, are cultured versus how we culture mouse, it's quite similar. Um, and so broadly not educated in the law, I would say it was obvious. Um, having said that, people have been trying for decades to make rat embryonic stem cells. And so usually people get confused between the difference between a mouse and a rat. They kind of think it's the same thing. And, you know, they do look at alike, and their blastocysts look alike, but there's something different about rats, and people have continuously failed to be able to make rat embryonic stem cells. So I think maybe it's obvious for the human stem cells because he succeeded. Um, and then finally, um, there's a nice insert in your uh, brochure on these new induced pluripotent stem cells, which are made completely differently um, from how traditional human embryonic stem cells are made. So human embryonic stem cells are generated from a, a human embryo, a blastocyst. But these new induced pluripotent stem cells, which pretty much have all the uh, functional characteristics of a human embryonic stem cell line, um, is made from your skin cell and then manipulations with different uh, gene products. And so that was not obvious. So that's probably patentable. And I guess that's where I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Berenger. We're going to form a panel of two now. And uh, first want to let Charles Come if you have any comment on what you just heard. No, uh, no. And then we get get some questions. Uh, Dr. Berenger uh, would uh, agree with the uh, some of the arguments made by the uh, uh, petitioner in the re-exam case. Um, the uh, the counter arguments to to the obviousness uh, issue 
are are quite technical and deal deal with issues such as the unpredictability and, and the uh, the rat uh, versus mouse uh, difficulty is one of them. You didn't know going in whether it it, it was rat uh, it, or or mouse uh, reactions. What works in uh, mice may not work in rats. Now. Uh, it may, if it's obvious to try to do these techniques, and there are a limited number of techniques available, then you're right back to KSR, which says uh, if it's obvious to try, and there was uh, uh, relatively high predictability as to the outcome, then uh, then it's obvious and, and unpatentable. The issue is the factual question of predictability, and there are other factors. Uh, as well, that uh, you can you can take into account in, in determining whether or not something was uh, uh, obvious to try. I wonder. I'm tempted. I mean, since this works in mice and humans, I mean, does this mean we're closer to mice than rats? I mean, is there? Can we make any kind of <laughs> judgment about that? Just <laughs> well, gee, from the point of view of the genome, I guess we are really quite similar. remarkably similar to both. Is that, is that right, or we are closer to mice? Maybe I'll, I can be forgiven for this. But uh, at, uh, at NIH, you understand that they've quit using rats as laboratory animals, uh, and they've uh, substituted lawyers. <laughs> and there, there, there are three reasons for this. Three reasons for this. One, they found that the researchers sometime would get attracted to the, uh, to the rats. Uh, uh, I may have moved this in the wrong direction. <laughs> and, and, and the last reason was that there are some things that rats won't do. <laughs> well, I don't want to speak. I mean, this is the year of the rat. I mean, we've just been through the Chinese New Year, and I don't want to get us uh, down on rats particularly. But let me ask a question, but I really do want you to you know, think of a question and get my attention here. So has a patent been applied for the Japanese work on somatic cell uh, uh, I'm not sure, but also, right on. Yeah, please. but also Jamie Thompson's lab succeeded. Um, they published right at the same time for human, but the Japanese group published in the mouse about a year earlier. Mm. Oh, I see. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, comment it, well, the comment is that the 913 patent is on the cells themselves, not their method of, of uh, production. So the Japanese uh, somatic uh, method uh, will, uh, uh, a, a patent could be granted on it as a method patent, but it would still infringe the, uh, the 913 patent. That happens all the time in the patent law. Uh, and so for someone to practice the, uh, the somatic method, you would still need a license uh, because you would still be... Uh, uh, infringing the 913 patent because if the cells ha are defined by the claims in 913, they're infringing. Yeah, I'm not sure how they're cultured, if it requires the lift or not. Probably not. Mm. Let, me, let me ask a, a follow-up and then, then, I'll, then I see a question. So in Dr. Berenger's lab, working with Thompson's cells, following all the rules, um, if if he were to make a major discovery, just big surprise, and mm -hmm. a result of working with these shell cells, can he patent that? I mean, yes. Who who owns what? Uh, you know, he used the cells and the techniques, I guess, out of Thompson's that are in Thompson's patent. Well, uh, the, the terms of the Wharf uh, license are such that. Uh, the if there's an improvement uh, uh, which the 913 patent reads on, that is to say, uh, all the elements are there in the claims of the new patent, then uh, then as I said, there's infringement. However, uh, it is not tr uh, accurate to say that if you commercialize, uh, if uh, 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 Dr. Berenger commercializes a different patent uh, that that Wharf is entitled to participate in the license uh, in the royalties to the extent that those claims do not read on the improvement. 
to seek to, to receive licensees fees from that is a, a, a patent misuse. You cannot expand your monopoly uh, uh, in that manner. Uh, to, you, you're attempting to claim a monopoly on something larger than the meets and bounds uh, uh, patent uh, boundaries that you have uh, uh, staked out in, in the earlier patent. And so that kind of argument must apply to patenting genes and you know, and if they're if they're multifunctional processes, you discover all kinds of mechanisms mm -hmm. that come. You can't own all of that just That's because right. you patented yeah. one gene. That's right. Okay. That's so, right. So I have a question back here. Right. So, Speak up because we don't have any mics. So we're taught in grade school about the scientific method and about how uh, basically you formulate a hypothesis and you test it, and that hypothesis is traditionally based on. Uh, on literature and past work that's been done, and that's the way that you make scientific progress. And my question is, uh, go, it goes back to the obvious to try argument. I'd say a good 75 to 85 percent of research done in institutions like Rice is based on previous work and kind of advancing the field. And so you could argue that 75 to 85 percent of research is obvious to try based on you know, informed hypotheses based on the literature. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on, on that concept of obvious to try and how it fits into kind of the research sphere for the, the, the tradition of research. Well, the, the principle in the patent law is that even though something is obvious to try, does not render uh, the subsequent result itself obvious. The mere fact that there, there are prior uh, knowledge, we all operate on the basis of prior knowledge. Uh, if, uh, if it's a eureka moment in the lab, and, and you may have been uh, drawn to try something, but if the result that comes out of it is something that was unexpected, uh, th that is not obviousness. Many times it will be. Uh, the best example is pharmaceuticals. Uh, a pharmaceutical company may be, uh, there may be 100,000 molecules that you may uh, seek to, uh, uh, or a radical, you may seek to attach to a uh, uh, to another base. Uh, if you have to go through a hundred thousand of them, by the way, that's undue experimentation. And therefore, obviousness does not apply to that situation. If there, if there are a dozen, and you can try them in a week, and you get an expected result, oh, this does work, that's obvious. Uh, but if you try 12, and, the, and one of them comes up with something that is 50 times more efficacious than what you would expect. That's non-obviousness. Do, does that uh, ring a bell? So really the obvious to try is also kind of blurred as to the obvious of the result. That's right. It's a, a obviousness is a subjective uh, Because I can uh, tell you from coming from a lab, much of what we try is motivated by the result that we expect. If we, if we don't expect something to happen kind of within reasonable bounds, we're not going to try it because that would be a waste of resources. Okay. What you describe is what, uh, what would be uh, uh, the result you got would be unpatentable because it was uh, obvious. And that's, a, and that's a difference between uh, sort of our ability to publish our scientific results, which doesn't require a eureka moment. Of course, they give prizes for that, but you don't have to have that. You can have an ex right. I mean, you can have, you can prove what you expect to come out, but it's still worth doing anyway, and it's publishable. And the peer reviewers like that when they see it in the proposals. And in a way, that's the criticism of today's science: is too conservative. The peer reviewers are too conservative. The journals are too conservative. Any really bold idea can't get funded. Those are overstatements. But that's where we are in in the science community right now. But the, the, but there's a but now that we part company, I guess with patenting. I mean, 
so this obviousness issue uh, we're more tolerant of that in science in our in our literature uh, so long as it's you do what you say you're going to do and you do it according to accepted standards but not in you can't get a patent for it that's right but still these results go on to become products yes you know become marketed yes. do they just not have patents yes yes by the way intellectual property uh, uh, also includes trade secrets one way in the commercial world of uh, protecting a discovery may be to keep it a secret. I mean, everybody knows about the formula for Coke, uh, Coca-Cola, right? That's supposedly a, a, an incredibly well-kept trade secret. The difference between a trade secret and a patent is, patent is valid for its life, 20 years now from the date of filing. Uh, a trade secret is uh, valid only as long as you keep it a secret. If someone discovers it or somebody else comes across it, uh, you've lost it. Uh, and, if so, and, and the only time you can recover is if someone, in fact, has stolen it, in which case uh, your, your remedy is to sue them for uh, the tort of conversion. But uh, trade secrets is also a way. But, of course, uh, when I went to, uh, through Rice in the, uh, the tradition of knowledge for knowledge's sake, the notion that one would seek a, uh, a uh, mercenary benefit from knowledge was sort of anathema. Uh, that's a, uh, uh, that still is something that seems ingrained in me, but it is out of step with the, rea the economic realities. We've grown a bit through the years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're going to quit pretty quickly, but just please. I have just one clarification here, or actually a two-part clarification. In your slide where you were talking about the three patents, and you mentioned just the last one, I guess, is under discussion, there were dates by each of them. Yes. And the first one in 98, the next one in 01, and the, the last one, the one in question, was not till 06. Mm -hmm. Were those issued then, those patents? That was the issue day. date. Because I thought that Dr. Thompson issued them all back in the late 90s. I didn't he applied for them. He applied for them. But, uh, but uh, there, the internal uh, meandering uh, was considerable. Uh, he applied, uh, got rejections, uh, made changes, uh, did something called continuation in part, uh, which uh, which has added new uh, added new material to he abandoned uh, some of the applications and the uh, patent that ultimately issued what is called a divisional patent uh, in in point of fact uh, one of his applications was determined by the examiner to contain more than one invention so he divided it into a divisional patent and that was the patent that subsequently issued in 2006. Uh, normally, it's a 24-month uh, 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 period uh, these days, uh, uh, depending upon the complexity of the patent. But it can be, it can be three, four, or five years. In this case, the, the 2006 patent uh, originated from a filing in 1995. 95. Prior to the publication, prior to the isolation, of, uh, of uh, human uh, embryonic I'm, stem cells. I'm curious, I forget when he published his monkey paper, monkey ESLs. That was, uh, 89, I guess. yeah, that, that's, that was earlier. And that formed the basis of the, uh, of the uh, 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 primate uh, embryonic cell, uh, stem cell patents. By the way, I, I don't know, did I mention that, uh, that Worf has 172 patents in this area, either issued or applied for, uh, 27, uh, 27 licenses to 17 companies. Uh, the principal uh, support of the research was Geron, which has exclusive licenses to a number of, uh, of uh, uses of the uh, uh, cell line. Oh, I mean, when, 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 in my remarks, uh, to be a little bit provocative, I sort of suggested that the current uncertainty about the Wharf patent, and you, and you clarified precisely where we are on that, might actually be interfering in some way with decisions made, perhaps not in universities, but in companies to, to proceed. But 
I don't really know if, if that is in fact the case, whether you have examples or you feel the uncertainty uh, is, uh, is inhibiting in any way could stem be. cell research. It could be. Uh, you, does that address me? Yeah, both of you. No, either, either of you. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, uh, it certainly could be as a matter of, because to engage in stem cell research requires uh, large investments of capital, right? So uh, if uh, it, uh, the argument is made that we shouldn't have patents like this because it does inhibit that kind of research, uh, uh, who's going to make these expenditures with the possibility that they will be stopped or will not be allowed to proceed because they're infringing someone's patent? And in this case, these patents are as yet un, uh, undetermined ultimately. Uh, and in fact, uh, for some companies, uh, that is a deliberate patent strategy. Uh, you amass a portfolio of patents, and as a result of that, you build a certain barrier to entry by competitors, whether or not your patents are valid. And keep in mind that it may be 10, 12 years before uh, the patentability uh, of, of this, uh, these patents are ultimately determined. That has a certain... Uh, uh, anti-competitive effect. Now, there are counter-arguments to that. Dr. Burns, you want to comment on that? Or? No, I agree with that. Um, okay. There's a biotech company in Houston in mouse genetics that got up all those patents probably to, to make those barriers. Yeah. I, I, think, didn't, I, I didn't mention this in, in my remarks, but uh, there was a 2007 uh, Patent Reform Act. Uh, it passed the House. Uh, but uh, as of two days ago, it died in the Senate. Uh, and there are, there are movements to try and change uh, some of the perceived uh, inequities and get some, some reform to modify some of, some of the uh, factors that are thought to be uh, uh, unwise as a matter of public policy. Uh, one of them is that, uh, to, to create a, uh, a post-issue challenge period. This exists in Europe. Uh, and the provision in the, in the 2007 Act was to allow a 12-month period where, for any reason, uh, cognizable under the uh, patent law, you could seek to invalidate a patent, uh, avoid the uh, very expensive cost of, of litigation. To go through a litigation with a patent uh, can be enormously expensive. I'm, I'm wearing a patented shirt. Uh, this is a uh, this is a wrinkle-free shirt, uh, and uh, and uh, we represented the manufacturer of this shirt. It actually works. It's a 100% cotton shirt, and it won't wrinkle. Uh, and a competitor uh, began to uh, infringe the patent. We sued uh, four years ago. Uh, the case is now before the Federal uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, and in the process. The parties have together expended more than $20 million in the litigation. That's a lot of shirts. <laughs> Who is the designer? I'm sorry? Who is the designer? The designer? The, uh, the, the patent relates uh, to the collar, the manner for keeping the collar uh, from wrinkling. Uh, and it, it, the idea is simple. Uh, uh, shirts wrinkle because the differential shrinkage between the thread that puts them together and the cloth. The invention is to insert a, uh, a uh, thermal adhesive polymer uh, in the course of the manufacture, which, uh, uh, which freezes the, uh, uh, the geometry of the thread and the cloth. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, uh, the defendants had the audacity to say that was obvious. <laughs> well, we, we have uh, boxes of shirts in different sizes outside, so... We deal with that separately. There two, if I could just take two last questions quickly, maybe get quick answers then here and then back, please. It seems many modern scientific discoveries are based on understanding and mimicking like natural behavior, natural chemicals, and natural like m metabolism. Like, how would this apply to the idea of originality and like obviousness? I'm not sure I understand that. Like, so, I mean, can you give an example of you're emphasizing natural things like and how? Pharmaceutical companies look toward like folk remedies and like herbs for for drugs that have like physiological effects. How would this affect 
say, like patentability and whether this would be original or obvious? It's not so much an obvious question as it is a uh, subject matter question under Section 101. The question you're asking is if a pharmaceutical company uh, uh, manufactures something which is n naturally occurring, is it patentable? The answer is yes if it is, uh, if it is outside the, the uh, natural environment. For example, if you can synthesize the thing in strawberries that makes strawberries taste like strawberries, that's patentable. In fact, many pharmaceutical patents will say isolated and purified. So it's out of the uh, out of the natural context that is patentable. Let's take a question here. Actually, I had two questions. One is a very quick one: is if academic institutions are doing research, I know you said that how the means to how that uh, finding was achieved does not have anything to do with the patent. But if you are uh, making an invention that is funded by by taxpayers. So why is it that some of those royalties don't, do not go back to, to NIH or, or to the taxpayers so that, so that more discoveries can be achieved? The law prior to 1980 was that if it was federally funded research, uh, the uh, patents arising from that research belong to the federal government. Uh, that was changed in, uh, in 1982 with the Bayh-Dole Act. Uh, uh, and, and, and frankly, the uh, rationale for it was government wasn't funding research the way it used to be. And this was an incentive to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, institutions. If we fund research, and, and we're not going to fund it all the way now, uh, uh, if something comes up, you can have the patent. And that's, uh, that's the law. There are all kinds of restrictions there. But that's basically the rationale. And my other question is, like, I've seen a, a patent for a gene, and, and I'm giving a, a specific example. Now, this patent is quite old. Now there's a new finding of new genes that are embedded inside a gene, which are called microRNAs. And this was not known at the time the patent was uh, uh, created. Would that patent still cover that? product that is within the sequence of that gene that is totally different function-wise from that gene. I mean, there's new discoveries mm -hmm. that were mm -hmm. not known at the time of the patent was created. Yes. Will that still be covered under that original patent? No. Mm -hmm. No. Section 112, enablement. If you haven't described it and demonstrated that you were in possession of the invention, then your original patent doesn't cover that. Okay. I want to uh, ask you to join me in thanking our excellent presenters. And thank you all for coming this evening. Please come again.